All right, and we're live. So welcome everybody uh, to our webinar on practical accessibility. Uh, my name is Rolf Smeds, and I'm a product manager for the Vaadin design system at Vaadin. And with me today, I have Jean-Christophe Guerriot, who is a senior software engineer on the consulting side of the company. So uh, we are going to be talking about the practical aspects of uh, making a Vaadin application accessible. And I usually like to start with uh, some words about digital accessibility, what that basically means in, in general. And oh, before I forget it, uh, I could mention that we unfortunately don't have time to take any questions during the presentation itself, but you can type questions into the questions panel uh, on, I think you're on the right-hand side, and we will try to have time for a brief Q&A at the end. So with that, let's get started. So digital accessibility. That is basically about ensuring that everybody can access and use your website or your application, regardless of what are di whatever disability or impairment that they may have. And those disabilities and impairments come in various flavors. So for example, uh, a user might have some kind of dexterity uh, or fine motor control issues so that they might have trouble clicking really small uh, click targets in the UI if they're using a, a, a pointer device like a mouse. Or uh, they might have trouble doing gestures uh, with the mouse, like drag and drop, for example. That's an issue a lot of people actually have. So it's not confined to people who have some kind of fine motor control issues. And then likewise on touch screens, uh, a lot of people can have trouble doing the types of, of swipe gestures and other kinds of gestures that are common on, on touch devices. So uh, of course, uh, if somebody is completely unable to use a pointing device like a mouse, then they will be bound to the keyboard. And that puts a lot of different requirements from the UI than you would have with a touch screen or a mouse driven UI. Then we have color blindness, which is quite common, uh, one in 12 men are uh, uh, allegedly have, have uh, some form of uh, color blindness, like the red green color blindness, which is the most common form. And the way that that can be an issue in a UI is, for example, if you're using color to convey information like uh, status. So let's say if we are using blue, red, yellow, and green to convey uh, some kind of status in the UI, that can be okay for people with normal color vision, but for somebody with color uh, vision issues, um, they might be unable to distinguish, for example, the red and the green from each other. And as you can see here, this is a simulation of the same four colors with red, green color blindness, where you can see that the red and green are virtually in, in undistinguishable from each other. And even the yellow one is so close to them that if you didn't see them side by side, you would probably not be able to tell which is which. And the way you usually deal with this is by adding something other than the color to convey the same information. That could be icons, for example, or text. And other types of low vision can also be an issue, of course. Um, many people with low vision need to use the browser, browser Zoom, uh, and it's recommended to support that up to 400%, which is a lot. But if you think about it, that means basically having everything four times as large as it normally would be, or to put it in another way, uh, having a window that is a quarter of its normal size. And one key thing to keep in mind here is that a window that is about a quarter of a normal desktop window size is roughly equivalent to a mobile phone screen. So uh, you can actually combine these two requirements into one, ensuring mobile uh, uh, screen uh, support and also ensuring browser zoom support up to 400%. Then of course we have various 
contrast issues. Uh, many people can have trouble properly reading text if uh, the contrast against the background is insufficient. Now, people who are unable to properly see the screen at all, for example, those who are actually blind or just have very severe uh, uh, vision impairments, uh, they typically use a piece of software called a screen reader, which uses text-to-speech to read the contents of the UI out loud. So since the user cannot, of course, see the screen then, and they're unable to use a pointing device like a mouse because they wouldn't know where to point, so they typically navigate the UI with the keyboard. Uh, screen readers also employ a feature called a virtual cursor that provides more advanced keyboard navigation controls than you would have just by uh, using a browser normally uh, and tabbing between, <clears throat> uh, moving between the focusable elements with the tab key. And they also provide shortcuts to different, different parts of the page, for example, the navigation, the header and footer and so on. And we'll talk a bit more about those shortcuts and how to make those uh, available in your UI in a moment. So when it comes to accessibility legislation, which is probably the reason why many of you are interested in ensuring accessibility, uh, in the US, we have uh, something called Section 508, which uh, is mainly about uh, public sector bodies or applications and websites uh, provided by public sector bodies and also publicly funded companies. It's been around since 1998, so it's definitely nothing new. And it's based on a standard for accessibility on the web called WCAG 2.0 level AA. In the EU, uh, we have since 2018 had a directive called the Web Accessibility Directive or Directive 2102. It's similar to Section 508 in that it also applies to public sector bodies and public service providers. And the interesting thing about 2102 is that it also specifically applies to employees of those public sector bodies. So applications and websites that are either provided for the general public or used by the employees of these organizations need to be accessible. And this is based on a standard called WCAG 2.1 level AA. So pretty much the same as section 508. And finally, also in the EU, uh, in about one and a half years from now, uh, that uh, those accessibility requirements will be expanded to many private sectors, including e-commerce, transportation, and banking, as part of something called the European Accessibility Act. It's based on the same accessibility standard as 2102. And uh, so all of these three pieces of legislation are essentially based on the same set of accessibility standards for the web. And that is WCAG, uh, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. It's really more of a set of guidelines and criteria than a standard per se. And it defines a whole bunch of criteria uh, for uh, that you should try to uh, fulfill in order to ensure that your website or web application is fully accessible. There's also another kind of a, I suppose we could also call that a, a kind of standard for accessibility called ARIA. Now, ARIA comes in, there's really, that really um, consists of two different things. One of them is the ARIA authoring practices, which is a set of recommendations and examples of how to build things in an accessible way for the web. There's also something called ARIA attributes, which are HTML features for uh, ensuring better screen reader support uh, that can be used to uh, add some semantic information that would otherwise be missing from HTML elements. So what you could, the way you could see these three things is that the WCAG standard is for what you should aim for and what you, we should use, what you should use for when testing uh, applications and websites for accessibility. The ARIA authoring practices are uh, guidelines for how to build things to uh, fulfill those criteria. And the ARIA attributes are, are helpers for making that happen. So with that out of the way, uh, let's get to actual practical accessibility testing 
of a Varen application. And there's a bunch of different tools and techniques we will use in this demonstration. First of all, the keyboard. Everybody has one. And it's one of the most important things to test with and test for. Uh, another one is a tool called Google Lighthouse, which is a testing suite uh, provided by Google and built into the Chrome browser. Then we're going to, we're going to be using a plugin called the Vardin Accessibility Checker, which is built by JC here. And he will be demonstrating how to use that uh, to both identify and to fix on the fly many common accessibility issues. And then finally, we will be using the component locator in Vardin Dev Tools and the accessibility tree in the browser's dev tools also built into browsers like Chrome and Firefox, unfortunately not available in, in Safari. And the uh, an, an application that is available for both Windows, Mac OS, and Linux called the Color Contrast Analyzer for analyzing color contrast. So um, I will now switch to this tab here to show you the application that we will be doing this demonstration on. So this is an old, um, originally uh, an old spring uh, demo application just for uh, showcasing how to build applications with spring. And uh, somebody made a voting port of that a few years ago, and we decided to just use that as our test bed here. Uh, it has a very uh, simple home screen with just an image and a welcome text. And it has a screen where you can uh, search for owners. Uh, it has some search fields, uh, button, buttons, and a table where you can go into the details of uh, an owner, a pet owner, and, and so on. So, you know, nothing fancy, a very simple, but somewhat realistic and a re realistically crude voting application. So the first thing we will be testing with is just the keyboard to see if we can actually use this UI just with the keyboard. And the way I like to start out keyboard testing is uh, to actually go into the URL bar and tap myself forward from there so that I get to the very beginning of the uh, page, uh, the very first, first focusable element on the page. So let's tab, tab, tab through the Chrome toolbar until we get to the page itself. So the first focusable element here is the link uh, on the logo, which, you know, as is conventional, just takes you to the home page. The next tab takes you to the navigation, uh, which jumps directly to the currently focused or the currently selected item, the currently selected link of the view that we're currently on. And um, this is a bit special in that it's built with volume tabs so that you're actually not navigating between those links with the tab key, but instead you need to use the arrow keys. So it's a bit weird for navigation, but it is usable by keyboard. There's not another kind of weird thing here because of the implementation using the volume tabs component, which is that if I press tab again, it will seem as if focus doesn't go anywhere. Now that is because there are nested links inside of these tabs. So we have basically two focusable elements nested inside of each other, which is not terrible, but it can be a bit confusing for users who rely on the keyboard. Um, pressing tab again, we get to the uh, uh, the search field, which is focusable, and we can type into it. Everything works just fine. When you press tab again, focus goes to the add owner uh, button. And as you noticed, maybe, hopefully, uh, it's skipped over that search button altogether. Now, it turns out if we go to the browser's dev tools here and inspect the implementation here. I'll make the font a little bit bigger. Um, you might notice that instead of being a button, this is just a Vardin icon with a bit of styling applied to it to make it look like it's a button. Now it's clickable because it, there's a click listener applied to it. 
but that won't do any good for a keyboard bound user because they will not be able to even focus it or trigger it if they would be able to focus it. So that's something that, uh, that would be the first thing that you should uh, fix when testing this with the keyboard. Now, if we keep tabbing onward, we get to the grid and it first takes you to the header and then the next tab stop is in the body and we can move around in the body. And if we press space here, we can select a row in the grid, but then that won't actually do anything because there are links embedded into the cells here, which uh, are actually triggered if I press space on the on a cell that contains one of those links. Now, the problem here is that, um, well, it does allow you to get to where you need to go, but you can't actually rely on the reuser realizing that their focus needs to be on that particular cell. It would be expected that they could follow that, uh, go, follow that link from anywhere in the grid. So it would be better if the selection itself would take care of the navigation. Now, the next kind of weird thing happens when I press tab again, which is that the focus seems to disappear entirely. This is an unfortunate side effect of running a Vaadin application in development mode, because that means that we have this dev mode widget here that you're probably used to seeing. Now, this dev mode widget here contains many focusable elements and even though the widget is collapsed like this, it's only visually collapsed and those focusable elements are still focusable. So they all add their own tab stops to uh, the focus um, order of this page. Unfortunately, those, there's no simple way to disable that widget uh, other than running the application in production mode. So you will just have to try to ignore uh, that weird uh, feature. So the next thing uh, we could do, so so yeah, so now we, we've identified a couple of minor uh, issues and one big issue in, in that the search button is not focusable or at all keyboard usable. The next thing we want to you do is use Google Lighthouse uh, to do a bit of proper access accessibility testing. So I'll open the dev tools again and I'll just move that to uh, the right hand side because it's easier to work with like that when using Lighthouse, in my opinion. So um, at the top here of the dev tools, you have all these tabs and one of those tabs should be called Lighthouse. Now, Lighthouse can do different types of testing. So you need to make sure that you have accessibility checked here in the, in the checkboxes. And I also like to do testing primarily on, in desktop mode. So make sure that you have that checked. And uh, you can do two different types of, you still do two different, different types of modes here for running the test. One is navigation that reloads the page and analyzes it when it has loaded. And the other one is snapshot. Snapshot is uh, usually more convenient because it tests the current state of the UI. So for example, if uh, you have a dialogue open, uh, you can test that dialogue. Uh, whereas if you use the navigation mode, you would probably lose that dialogue because it would not be open when the page loads. So uh, we'll click uh, analyze page state here. Takes a couple of seconds and you get a score that honestly, in my opinion, doesn't really help you much. But if you scroll down, uh, you'll find these various uh, findings, issues that it has found. So first of all, we find, uh, we, we get a finding called buttons do not have an accessible name. And unfortunately, this very first hit is again caused by the Vaadin DevTools widget. This div dot window, div window toolbar button tab is actually inside here. So again, this is not part of your own UI. You can just ignore it, but you might have other buttons that don't have an accessible name. So just seeing this doesn't mean that you should always ignore it. It just means that this deep dot window thing here is one hit you could actually ignore. Uh, then we go to the next one, 
which is which says form elements do not have associated labels. That's a real issue that it has found. And it highlights here the uh, owner search box, as you can see. And uh, what this means is that this search box here, the text field, it doesn't have a label associated with it. And as you can see here, it, it indeed doesn't have a visual label. Uh, it only has an icon, but the problem with icons is that uh, people who cannot see the icon doesn't know that it's there, or at least if, even if they knew there's an icon there, they would not know what icon it is. So um, as screen readers are unable to convey that information in any way. So that's definitely an issue you need to look into. Then we go forward and uh, there are a, uh, there, there's a, an issue about a link that doesn't have a discernible name. And as you can see, it's highlighting the spring logo link here at the top left corner. Uh, what that means is that this is a link that doesn't have any kind of name associated with it. It's an image, but again, people who are unable to see that image, for example, those who are using a screen reader are unable to see the image and don't know what it says. So um, you would need to add some kind of text alternative to that image for it to be accessible. And finally, uh, we have a long list of findings here under the title background and foreground colors do not have a sufficient contrast ratio. And as you can probably see, it's highlighting the add owner button here. For some reason, it does it twice. Uh, then there's one uh, one item here that seems to target the root HTML element. And honestly, I have no idea why it does that. So just ignore that one. And then we have a list of each of these uh, links in the table, each of which is uh, listed twice for some reason. I think it's listing the link containing the text and separately also the table cell containing the link. And uh, so what these mean is that the text of the add owner button against the light gray background of the button doesn't fulfill the minimum contrast criteria defined by the WCAG standard. Some people with low vision might be unable to properly read that text. And likewise, uh, the green color of these links here is insufficient against the white background of the table. And those were, and there's a lot of these. It's of course repeating every single instance of that problem uh, separately. And then it also uh, tells you that there are a bunch of additional items you need to check manually and you could go through those and it tries to give you some brief explanations of what all the various things that you should be testing manually are. These are things that the tool is unable to detect on its own. All right, uh, that was keyboard testing and testing using the Google Lighthouse uh, feature in Chrome. Uh, next up, I'll give it over to Jean-Christophe and he can show you the uh, Vaadin Accessibility Checker plugin that he built. And yes, we can go to the page and just try to use the dev tool as, um, as maximum as possible. So this is the dev tool. You should have it like uh, in your application if you're running it in development mode. And since Vaadin 24, you have this component locator. We will use it a lot. And also theme editor to change the CSS in your application. And the accessibility checker, which is a third party uh, plugin. And we can just start to run the check and wait for a couple of seconds. And you can see in this home page, you have like 14 issues three violations and seven need review. You can click on it to filter them. And the activity checker will check based on the context. So if you change the page or you if you're changing something in the page and you can rerun the checks and it will find 
different type of issue. And now you got 31 issues. So let's go back to the home page and rerun the check to focus basically on the layout because the main page, the home page is quite empty. And we want to fix first the violations because that's the most important fix to fix the things to fix and we can see here there is a list of issue the first is a global issue it's about the title which is not defined here it's empty so you can just see the address here and if i'm clicking on the detail here you can see there is a quick fix for with a link to the page title the Padding documentation. Also, we can change the page title right here and more detail. So it's generic detail. I can click on this with a lot of information, like why it's important, because that's the first thing people will see, the title. And here it doesn't make any sense for, for the user. And how to what to fix, what to do. So here it's it gives us a solution but in html not a vadin solution and you can see also on the right side some wcag uh, wcag link so if you want to learn more about accessibility and you can go there there and read <coughs> the the content and who does this affect so people with screen reader blind people and Almost every everybody who has like multiple tabs in his browser will see first the title. So everybody is concerned by this. And I can go back here and I can just set the title. So that's the home. And I can add it's a home for pet clinic. And just click on it. Now it seems to be sold. You can see that the title has changed here and if we are going to the code with this button you can see here that this is added this annotation page title and uh, the name of the page so we can go back to our application here and go back to the list and we will try to fix the uh, third violation which is a link so you can see it's highlighted in purple here it's the link detected also by lighthouse which has no name so if you want to interact to this link you 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 don't you, you don't know where you are going so just we can just fix the name so there are multiple ways of, of say uh, of uh adding a name to the link and here there is it's a background image so you can't put a name to a background image. If it's an image, you can put an al alternative text or just set an area label here. And Which, by the way, is one of the new features in Vardin 24.2, uh, if I remember correctly. So yeah. there is now an API for adding ARIA labels uh, to uh, most yes, components. Yes, the set ARIA label is available for most of our component that can have an ARIA label. Yeah. So, uh, so there is an and, interface as ARIA label. Yeah, and, and an ARIA label is basically an invisible label that you can set on the component or element mm. that a screen reader can announce to the user, but that isn't visually displayed anywhere. And the last error is about the page doesn't have a quick way to navigate to the main content. And we are talking about ARIA Landmark. And Rolf, can you explain what is ARIA Landmark? Sure. So if we switch over to, let's see, my screen. I can like do so. it for you. <laughs> thank you. It's done. <laughs> yes, thank you. Right, so um, to explain what landmarks are, I want to start with explaining how a screen reader user will perceive the web page. So for us with normal vision, uh, when we when we go to a web page, we can basically see the most of the page 
uh, in, in some cases, the entire page in a single glance. We can see everything that is in it. We can understand what its structure is and, and get a kind of understanding just in like a fraction of a second of where things are on it. So in this case, we know that there's a, a header bar at the top with the name of the title of the application. There's a hamburger menu. There are some navigation links on the left. There's a form in the middle and there's a footer at the bottom with some buttons for uh, presumably for, for submitting the form and so on. So we can instantly perceive and understand the entire page. We don't have to try to figure out, well, where is the navigation? Because we can see it. However, uh, for a screen reader user, they can't see any of that. They cannot, literally cannot see the page. They cannot see any kind of two-dimensional representation of it. What they instead see is one element at a time because this is how the screen reader works. It reads out loud one element at a time as you navigate the page with the keyboard. So there's a menu, there's a title called app, app name. There's a link and a link and a link and a link. There's a heading and there's a field called first name. There's a last name field. There's an email address field and there's a role field with the value user. This is exactly, or almost exactly how a screen reader user will, will perceive the page, one element at a time in a one dimensional sequence of elements. Now, the way that you perceived it here now is actually even uh, higher fidelity than how a screen reader, reader user would perceive it because you saw how the, this uh, highlight moves around in a two-dimensional area. But of course, a, for a screen re reader user, that would just be, as I said, a one-dimensional sequence. So for example, if I'm here on the role field, how do I know how I get to, how do, how do I know how to get to the navigation? What if I want to navigate to a different page? How do I even know if there is a navigation control on this page? That can be pretty difficult without, you know, backtracking, uh, tabbing back to the beginning of that part of the page. Well, this is a bit similar to when you're reading a book, because when you're reading a book, you're not really perceiving the entire book or even the entire page typically uh, in one go. Typically, you're reading maybe one word, maybe an entire sentence. At best, you might be able to perceive an entire page if there are images on it, uh, if there are different paragraphs of text, maybe some headings, you might be able to perceive that in a single glance. But what if you want to go to a different part of the book? You wouldn't know where to go. You would instead have, you would just have to, you know, start turning pages backward or forward and see where you, see, see what comes up basically. Well, that's not a very efficient way to find anything in a book. So books have, of course, a solution for this, the table of contents. You go to the beginning or the end of the book and you'll find the table of contents and the table of contents will list all of the different sections of the book. And then you can just jump to page three where we have the Welcome to Office 2010 <laughs> chapter and the great thing is that HTML and screen readers together have a similar solution, which are called landmark elements. Landmark elements are regular HTML elements like header, main, footer, and nav, which represent exactly what those names kind of sound like they would represent. These are regular HTML elements, just like div and span and input and so on. And they don't have any other function than to convey what the role of that part of the UI is. And uh, yes, the Flow framework has a Java classes that represent uh, each of these semantic landmark elements. So the way that these landmark elements are used by screen readers is to build a table of contents. Uh, a screen reader has a some kind of keyboard shortcut depending on uh, the reader in question. 
uh, that brings up a list of the landmarks on the page. So for example, on this page, we would have a header, a navigation, a main, and a footer. And uh, the user could then easily use the keyboard to select one of those elements and jump directly to it. Uh, you can also provide names for these elements, for example, using the ARIA label. Uh, so you could, if you have multiple navigation items, uh, navigation controls on the page, you might want to distinguish them by giving them different names. And um, maybe if the footer is specifically for form actions, you might want to uh, indicate that in, with uh, giving it a specific name. Uh, so these names will then be uh, listed together with the type of landmark element. And there are other elements, uh, other things uh, on the page that will also be uh, listed like this. For example, uh, screen readers typically allow you to list all the headings on a page. Now in this particular example, there's only one heading, which is the user profile uh, title of that view. But if you had multiple headings, it would indicate uh, the level of the heading. So it's, if it's an H1, H2, H3, and so on, and then uh, the actual text content of that heading. And uh, just like with the landmarks, uh, the user can jump directly to that heading by selecting one of those options on the list. So that is what landmarks are, and that is why landmarks and also correct headings and heading levels are important. Then we can go back to our page and we will try to add this structure to the page. So let's see first, I'm going back to the issues we had, we had this violation, but also like recommendation, like the vetting types here are not in the landmark. So the tool, the tool is complaining like when something is not in structure, like the title also is not in a landmark. And we can see the structure using the uh, accessibility tree in Chrome. So we, you can go, it's by default disabled, but you can go and accessibility and enable the full page accessibility tree here. And it will add this button. And I can click on it. And instead of seeing the DOM structure, you will see the accessibility tree. And so the accessibility will... tree is like a kind of a simplified version of the HTML structure of the page uh, that only conveys like the semantic structure. And that uh, semantic structure is what screen readers use to parse the page and navigate through it and, and announce its contents to the user. So in, in short, it, like before you had a bunch of vertical or horizontal layout, also div, and it's just generic container that doesn't convey any semantic. So they are just ignored as one, one thing. And if you're going back to the structure, it's just links, tab list with the tab, heading page, and the Vadin logo, that's the footer. You can see that's already like the header here. And you also have this generic, this is the dev tool. And it's, you can see it as generic because there are a bunch of buttons which are really important for everybody. Then we can go to our dev tool and I will use the code, lo the component locator uh, embedded in Vadin. You can find the component in code by clicking on this and it's when it's created. So when you are adding a new component, uh, it will, like if you're clicking on this, this is definitely the header, then you will navigate directly to your horizontal layout, which is create header content. The code is already know that it's a header. And this is just a horizontal layout and we will wrap this horizontal layout into a header component because we don't want to break the entire layout. So we can just add this header and we can just 
close it and import the class. Every HTML tag has a Java, a Java API, which is in the HTML package. So you can see header and import the class. All right. Then I can go back to my application here. And let's change the footer also. Let's, yes, I changed the Java code. So the page is reloading and I can go to the code and find here the, this is the image inside the footer. And same thing, the variable is footer. So that's the right place. And in that case, I will use different uh, way I will just replace the footer, the horizontal layout to footer. It has like more chance to break the layout, but it's also like clean up a little bit the structure. You don't have like a footer and div and horizontal layout and, and so on. <clears throat> and you can see here content. This is the main content here. And it's just a div, so we can replace it to a main. So technically, it's the same thing, uh, except that it bring the semantic the semantic main. Yeah, so I mean, as a rule of thumb, you could say that if you have a div, you can just replace that div with a main or a header or a nav or any of these landmark elements without changing, without affecting the layout, because they basically work the same way as a div uh, in the browser. But if you have a VOD in horizontal or vertical layout, you might instead need to wrap that into one of these landmark elements because otherwise you will lose the layouting uh, that that layout component provides. Mm -hmm. The flex, uh, horizontal or vertical. Yeah, the and flex it flex. also can break the CSS if you're using div dot something, but it has less chance to break break your layout. But every time you're doing changes, then you have to test it just after. And you can see in the accessibility tree, now there is a banner with our link, with the name home page we changed. And now the main and content info, which is our footer. We didn't add like any name here for the banner or main or content info. But we could, if we but want. we don't really need because there's only one of them. Um, yeah, the website is quite simple. What, yeah. what one curiosity here is that uh, um, Chrome calls the header a banner, and the footer a content info, uh, and that is because uh, those names are the corresponding ARIA role names for those landmark elements. So uh, it can be a bit confusing, but just you know, try to get used to the the, the idea that each of these landmarks have, may have two different names, one of which is the element uh, HTML tag name, and the, the other one is the ARIA role of uh, that element. And then we can go back to the accessibility checker and just check. And we have no violation on no. all. That's better and better. And we can see, friend, we are scrolling down, down. We can see a bunch of errors because of the Vadin tabs and the Vadin tab. The tool is seeing that there is something to review because there is a tab and inside there is a link. And it just say that it's ignored at the browser. We already tried it. It's not completely ignored, but the web, like the behavior is quite confusing. So let's change this to uh, navigation. So <clears throat> we can go here, just open the component in the IDE, create menu items. I already have a function, create menu, and we don't want to create uh, tabs, but just a simple navigation with uh, some CSS because we are just removing that in tabs and replacing everything to a nav and a list of uh, links. So we have to change the CSS. The CSS has already been done before, so we won't show you the, the entire CSS. And of course, I need to fix the compilation error because the menu is now in navigation. 
and I got another issue at the end of my page. It's when we are navigating before we were selecting the correct tab. And now it's done automatically by the router link. So we can just like remove remove this. I'm going if I'm re going back to this, I can just remove all of this. So, so the moral of the story is that um, instead of using tabs for navigation, if you just need a horizontal list of links, just place router links uh, directly into a into a nav, for example. We have uh, two choices, multiple choices, of course, but like the navigation is the uh, basic HTML tag. And also we have a component site navigation, site nav, which is new in Badin 24.2, if, I, if I'm not doing a mistake. And I think it was already in 24.1, actually. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. And it's like uh, a really good component to make site navigation. Uh, vertical here navigation. For the vertical, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> And if we're going back to the page, we can test it with the navigation, with the keyboard and tab, 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 tab. Everything is quite fine. I can type enter and I'm navigating. And now if I'm going back to the accessibility checker, you can see only two need review, two recommendations. That's look better and better. The first issue is a global uh, issue. It's fi verify you if there is a way to bypass blocks of content. So when you are using a screen reader, uh, if you're using a keyboard navigation, you don't want for every page to navigate like to the navigation and first link, the second link, and so on. You want just to skip to content, to the main content. You can do it by using the main uh, area, or you can also add a link, skip to content. <clears throat> and we won't show it today, but you, you can add it. And the next one is just verify if the CSS background image doesn't convey important information, but it's on a style, so it's a false positive. <clears throat> and the two other issues it's just recommendation it's about high contrast mode and it's for windows and we are both on mac so today we won't uh, demonstrate this high contrast mode and we'll sk skip it for this session then we can go to the next page and that's more interesting because now you've got a vadin grid and but and some action to do so we can just filter by violation and let's go to the first one. The first one is a contrast issue. The, this padding icon has only a, a contrast of 3.67 uh, and it's apparently not enough for text. So let's use our color contrast analyzer and we can pick the color here. This is the foreground color and the background color. This is the background color. And you can see it's failing for regular text, but it's OK for large text and also for graphical objects. And this is an icon. So that's it's a graphical positive. object. It's yeah. a graphical object. <laughs> So it's then, a false positive. We've only already had at least two false positives. So one important thing to learn is that any accessibility checking tool will give you some false positives as well. Yeah. And we can go to the next error. The next error is, oh, the thing what was detected by uh, Lighthouse. Lighthouse. This input doesn't have a name. So we can just add a name. It's easy for people who can like cited user be, to like uh, make the connection between find user with this icon and the input it just after it but for a screen reader it's more hard to see the link 
So we can just add find by search by name and we will add it as a label so everybody will know that we are searching by name not by address or city but of course it depends on, on your uh, application and you can also use invisible label for this mm -hmm. and now it's fixed and we can go to the next issue and that's a contrast issue and if i'm going back to the list you can see that there is one contrast issue another one but a bedding button another one with the same contrast uh, it's basically the same issue repeated multiple times uh, if you are familiar with uh, lumo our lumo theme this is the primary color and it's green and we can try to use this tool so the foreground color i will use this button because the this is blank and green and this is gray and green so the contrast is slightly uh, less important and foreground color and background color is this and it's failing for every yeah for everything so let's go to you can change the foreground color and make this green a little bit darker and just slide it a little bit contrast ratio is more than three so now it's okay for this icon but it's not okay for the button and for the text and we can go and we want to go more than 4.5 and everything is okay except if you want a a a but right now we will focus on just WCAG AA. Yeah, level AA is the the uh, level of, of WCAG uh, that uh, pretty much all legis legislation uh, out there currently uh, is based on. Level AAA is a more strict level that, um, well, I think most people don't don't necessarily need to need to live up to at the moment. And I can go back to my variable and that's, I will change this Lumo primary text color and same for the color and also the derived colors, the 50% for primary and 10% for primary. And now I can just refresh my page. You can see that here the colors, color is a little bit darker and I can just run the checks. Two violations. Oh, it's almost okay. Uh, it's, it's again a false positive because of the color of this button. Maybe I should have picked a slightly uh, darker. It's exactly, oh, yes, I can pick five. this one. It's rounded, so ah, it's rounded. Okay, yeah, yeah. you know, demo effect, <laughs> <laughs> rounding error as a demo effect, yeah, in a, uh, contrast checker. Okay, uh, I guess it doesn't help to have a little bit more contrast than less. Yeah, and then I can go back and should only have one violation because of the icon. And now one violation, three need review and two recommendations. So I got one need review more than my first page. And it's about the vadding grid. And uh, we should confirm and test that it should be a uh, keyboard navigator. You should navigate with the keyboard. And you already show it at really? the beginning. So we, we already review it. So that's quite fine. And I think that's it for the cake. I, we don't have more time to go to a new page, I think. And it's yeah, no. probably better to have to check the question and answer them. Exactly. Uh, what, before we get to the questions, there's one more thing I want to point out, which is uh, that uh, in order to ensure uh, the best accessibility, uh, you should, of course, be on the latest version of Vaadin which as of yesterday is 
Uh, if you cannot be on volume 24, you should at least be on volume 23 because we uh, shipped a lot of uh, accessibility improvements in volume 23 and, and its minor versions. All right, uh, we have a couple of questions. Let's have a look at that. Uh, will the video be available after this live event? Uh, I believe so. Uh, we usually uh, publish uh, them uh, on YouTube uh, sometime after the event. Yes, we actually already got that answer from Brian. All right. Um, do we have any other questions? I don't see any. Hmm? Uh, will accessibility standards lead to boring looking <laughs> UI? Oh, that's a good question. I'm, uh, I actually, um, I'm a former UI designer myself. And um, I think before I start, got into accessibility myself, uh, I, I was kind of under the impression that you had to choose between good looking UIs and, and boring looking UIs. But now that I've worked with accessibility uh, a bit more uh, for uh, about three years, I've come to realize that no, that's not necessarily the case. Um, it does, of course, um, ensuring accessibility does, of course, mean that uh, you need to always keep it in mind when, for example, picking colors and so on. I think one good example is the fact that um, uh, the Vardin input field components like text field and so on uh, don't have any borders by default. And that's a purely aesthetic choice that was made uh, many, many years ago. Uh, the problem with borderless input fields is that um, they would need to be very dark against the background or have a very high contrast against the background in order to fulfill the non-text contrast criteria to make them sufficiently visible for people with uh, vision impairments. And if you make a volume input field dark enough against the white background that it fulfills that level of contrast, it will be too dark to, well, it will look terrible for one thing, and it will be a bit too dark for to display the text inside of it properly. So um, the solution for making volume input fields uh, fulfill contrast requirements uh, is to actually add a border around them. And we now have uh, a very simple way to do that uh, uh, through a, a style property that you can find in the styling tab of uh, the input field documentation. Uh, but we decided not to enable that by default because we know that a lot of people will, would prefer to not have that border around it. So uh, in some cases there are you know, of course, um, you, you, you might feel that uh, you would need to make the UI less pretty to make it also accessible. And there are cases where you need to make compromises, but by and large, um, I wouldn't really say so. You just need to keep things in mind that you are, wouldn't otherwise uh, perhaps do. I guess uh, also we, if like, uh you need to pick the correct component for what you are doing. If you're, if you're using the wrong component, then you will fight against accessibility. And if you're starting and fight against everything, for example, if you're using a vetting tab, you will need to do a bunch of CSS. And after you, you will check and, oh no, it's not a navigation any, anymore and so on. So maybe yeah. that's the, that makes a little bit things, I think, more boring because you have to pick the correct thing. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, um, I, I think what it does is that it kind of prevents you from, from come up, coming up with solutions that are too clever. Uh, it, it does kind of steer you towards more traditional solutions. But I think in the end, um, what is good for accessibility is usually also good for the user experience. So maybe it's just kind of good for us designers to be uh, a little bit restricted by by these uh, requirements. Uh, Dominic asks uh, if the color contrast analyzer is a Chrome plugin. Yes, yeah, sorry, forgot to mention that it's not a browser plugin. It's a separate uh, utility application that's available for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. 
uh, and well, you can probably find it on Google if you just search for color contrast analyzer. And uh, the thing that I really like about this particular uh, color checker tool is that it has these sliders that you can use uh, to find uh, the breaking point where uh, the contrast becomes just high enough to fulfill the criteria. Since you can see at the bottom of the tool when the uh, the indicators go from red to green. Stefan asks, will the new menu introduced in Vardin 24.1 be also backported to Vardin 23? Um, no, we generally don't backport components to older versions of Vardin, unfortunately. Um, we would just have to spend too much time backporting and, and uh, backporting both the features and then all the bug fixes to those features and so on. So at the moment, we don't have plans to do that. Um, so I suppose um, uh, it could be arranged, but not by default. All right, we are exactly one hour into the webinar now. So I think if there are no more questions, we might just wrap it up. Um, here's the URL for the accessibility checker tool that JC built. You can also find it by going through the, to the directory on the Vardin.com website and searching for Accessibility Checker. Um, here's my email and my Twitter handle in case you want to get in touch. And also I want to remind everybody that there is an accessibility channel called A11Y uh, in our Discord chat that you can find through that URL at the bottom. Thank you for watching and um, maybe see you next time in some upcoming webinar on accessibility. Thank you.